Great. So I'll be monitoring um, as more people might come in. Uh, but welcome. Uh, my name is Melanie Grunewald. I'm the executive director at Kabbalah Experience. Uh, if we haven't met, um, Kabbalah Ex Experience is a center for adult spiritual education uh, based in Denver, Colorado, but reaching students and faculty all over the world. Uh, and we're just grateful that you've taken the time to show up and uh, join us today uh, for uh, the beginning of our three-part series on the Kabbalah of Shtisel. And I'm grateful to be joined here uh, by David Sanders, who is the founder and the spiritual director of Kabbalah Experience. So welcome and feel free to take it away. All right, great. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have uh, seen all three seasons? Me. Um, and of course, those who, I, who are not on the video, I can't see you're raising your hand. Um, so please join us if you can by video so we can see you as well if that's if that works for you and if not um, wonderful to welcome you so uh, Stissel has been a, a fascination uh, for many of us for quite a while now and I've taught a few classes on it um, with an eye to looking at it from a Jewish spiritual lens, which we call Kabbalah. And um, we're gonna dive in quickly and you'll see that uh, we do like it to be participatory, meaning um, I may ask you some questions or put those out there and feel free to um, join in and comment. As long as we don't get much larger, we'll be able to do it that way. Um, but uh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. And um, I want to start with a, a piece from the Zohar. Come and see. There is a garment that is seen by all. When fools see a man in a garment that appears beautiful, they look no further. But the value of the garment resides in the body, and the value of the body resides in the soul. Similarly, the Torah has a body. This body is clothed in garments, which are the narratives. Those who are wise look beneath the stories at the body, and those even wiser look at the soul. And there is even a soul within the soul. Right. So I want to open it up a little from the outset to ask you, um, what, what would you say is the body uh, I'm sorry, what, what would you say is the clothing of Stissel, the body of Stissel, the soul of Stissel, and the soul within the soul of, of Stissel? So let's, let's open that up to your comments. And um, uh, <clears throat> obviously, if I can see you, I can see if you're raising your hand that you'd like to say something. If I can't see you, um, but you do want to say something, enter the chat. So anyone want to venture about what the body is or what the clothing is of Stissel? And then we'll look at what the soul is. Family? The clothing is obviously the um, traditional Hasidic, uh, very modest, conservative clothes. Uh, the men wear uh, black suits uh, with their, with their, I don't remember what it's called, their undergarment with the tzitzis and the large black hat and the women wear um, longer skirts and their arms are covered uh -huh. and they wear uh, 
shadows. I think they're called the waves. For those for those women that are married, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that um, Suzanne, thank you very much for opening up the discussion. Yeah, June. Uh, June, unmute yourself. Not so good at this. I'm still. Am I okay? Yeah, perfect. I think it represents boundaries um, in the, the garments, and they represent external boundaries and internal boundaries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the garments tell people who these people belong to, a, a little bit about them. The, the, the garments represent also a lot about how they feel and how they function. And I think it's, it's quite clear to those that know what it represents, um, how they live, the, the group they belong to. And it's, it's all about boundaries because I see boundaries personally as two things. One, to protect, obviously, if you touch a boiling hot pot, but the other boundary is to tell the world what we like and what we don't like. So it's, it's a boundary that many people don't understand because it's very important for people to respect people if we know their boundaries. And I think Stiesel is a big, a big representative of that boundary. Excellent. Um, so we're, we're, we started with a piece from the Zohar that talks about the different layers of Torah interpretation. And we're gonna be looking at different layers of interpretation of the show. Um, so we started with the clothing, right? That's the, that's the most external piece. Mm -hmm. But as June is saying, the external piece also reflects a lot about what is being told by that, right? It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's a clue. Mm -hmm. about who these people are, what they believe in, what they value, and it sets a boundary. Okay. Now, when the Zohar says underneath the exterior, underneath the clothing, is the body, what might this mean metaphorically in terms of shtisel? What is, what is the next level under the clothing? Uh, Ivor. So before we get there, I was wondering if... Oh. The if all the rituals are actually the clothing. Right. Um, anything that's exterior will be the part of the clothing. But if we look at a ritual, Ivor, what would we then say is the layer, the next layer underneath the, the ritual? Well, that, that's the next question, yeah. But what, I, would, what, would be, what would be beyond that or underneath that? All right, Leslie, Leslie, you raised your hand, I'm told. Go ahead, Leslie. Yes, I did. Um, the body, I think, is a, a story about family. And, uh, you know, it's the story behind everything. It's, uh, you know, you're talking about a family and all the extensions of the family and everything that goes on with the family. It's really a family story. That's you, the body. Yeah. So um, uh, let me share my screen again. Uh, is everyone seeing the document? Okay, so that was the Zohar piece. So, so far, um, I, I listed the garment just to, just to resonate with what you've said already. Garment, Shtisel is a story about an insular ultra-Orthodox Haredi family living in a cloister community in Jerusalem. And the clothing and as Ivor just pointed out, the rituals also represent that. Um, so to highlight what you just said, body, the shtisels are a family first and ultra-Orthodox second. They go about their business in a relatively ordinary fashion, loving and awful in turns, the way families are. Um, so Leslie, thank you for that. And um, Again, someone, I, I, I think that sometimes people will say, um, yeah, I, I don't want to watch Dissel. It's about this ultra-Orthodox family. I can't relate. But then Leslie correctly points out and says, well, yeah, but why, 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 do, why does it resonate for me? Or why does it resonate for so many people? Because it's, 
in the end, it's really a story about a family, which doesn't mean that we're not getting the clothing and all the externals. All right. Um, what would be the soul of Shtisel? Religion. Suzanne, you have your finger up. <laughs> I would say God. The soul is the, the, the core of our being. Okay. And it's God who gave us our soul and gave us our body. And um, uh, so so I, I'm, I'm going to be saying this a little tongue in cheek, but um, uh, I don't know if they gave God billing in this show. Um, you know, they didn't, they certainly didn't bring God in from central casting. So um, uh, where, as, as in some other films, um, so where does God show up? I, and I'm, I, not, I'm not disagreeing with you, by the way. No, well, I think that was done on purpose. God is there all the time and he's purposely not emphasized to emphasize <laughs> the life and lifestyle of the people as human beings within this community. So the, the I believe the screenwriter did that on purpose. Nice. Show, because not only Jewish people are watching this, non-Jewish people are watching it also out of curiosity or out of being invited by Jewish friends. Okay. Wait, yeah. And, and they they might say, like you just said, well, where was God in all this? In all this, you know, in this movie. And yeah. Then it brings out that, okay, we're dealing with human beings. And even as ultra orthodox, guess what? They don't always do what they are supposed to do. Even, you know, uh, the part where the young men were out in the forest right. and were calling out to God. And eventually they ended up laughing from maybe the exhaustion or maybe the Maybe they realized this is silliness or, or they weren't taking it seriously. Yeah. This is all part of being human, whether you're orthodox or not, you're human. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I, 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 li I like your exposition about that God is kind of permeating the whole show. Susan and then June. Thank you. Uh, for me, uh, the first thing that came to mind, the soul of Schitzel, uh, is there un- wavering uh, commitment to their or ultra orthodox beliefs and um, rules and, and um, their observation uh, of those guidelines based in the Torah. Um, that to me is the soul of Shtitzel. Um, their, their utter commitment to everything that they have learned. Now, um, I, I really, I'm, it's wonderful that we're entertaining all of the, of the ideas that, you, that are being suggested. Susan, since I know you, um, I'd be willing to say this, which is that I might suggest that that ties into what June said before, which is that that's part of the clothing that they wear. You know, the, 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 that, that deep commitment they have now, it doesn't mean to say that it's not a deep commitment, of course, but it's still the, the what, we're, what we're noticing often in the, in, that's portrayed is the outward observance of that, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're, mm -hmm. seeing, we're seeing how they show up with that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we get to their interiority of what really is going on underneath that and what it means for them. But, but uh, I think it's a, really good, it's a really good point of where they start. Yeah, June. I think Stiesel's soul is revealed in his painting. I think we learn a lot of his painting and ultimately when he painted all those pictures of his wife, it brings his soul into it. Mm -hmm. I think his art is, an, is the vehicle through which we see him as a, a, a with his soul and as a human being. Yeah. So I, I'm going to focus a little differently today, um, but an alternative 
way to look at soul here is exactly what June is suggesting. It's about, you know, creativity, right? It's about who we become and how the artist represents that. There's a quote in one of Chaim Potok's books, uh, Asher Lev, about how the, how the artist needs to um, actually leave the community that they grew up in to really express fully their soul, their artistic and creative uh, uh, self. So, but I wanted to share with you something that um, we, we are gonna look at throughout the three, class, three times we're together. And that is the soul as it, it's a one line sentence. How does one heal from loss and not remain stuck in the past? This is a theme that runs through the entire, all, all the seasons. And I'm sure that you've, you've taken note of it, but I want through our exploration to see how deep a theme this becomes. And really that this is uh, the, the key theme that's going on throughout the, the show. And then the soul within the soul, and maybe this connects to what June just said, what is, what is the risk taking? What is the, what is the risk that one has to take to move forward and move beyond what is comfortable? Okay. Uh, yes, Ivor. So I was thinking that the, the soul, um, in his soul is love and connection. There was a, a, a real motivator for him he, he looked for love and he looked for connecting with other people <coughs> he dated a million times and looking for a wife etc etc then after then you know subsequent uh, uh, to that too um and i'm just wondering to answer that question um of uh, how do you get over um the losses is his need for love and connection was the overriding motivation for him to overcome these losses. And if you can find something that's more meaningful than dwelling on the losses, you can then overcome those losses. Yes. <clears throat> uh, excellent. Does anyone else want to say something before I um, highlight what Ivor just said <laughs> through a quote? Um, Okay, so, oh, there, there was someone, go well, ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, like um, the theme is consistent where Akiva, you know, the father's pushing and pushing and pushing and then the other, um, the, what's his name? Git, 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 Giddy's son, you know, that mother's Giddy's pushing and pushing with these, you gotta marry the right, the right person. And both of those characters pushed back and went, you know, went against the, perfect family to marry into and yeah laurie so that's that's where i'm i'm suggesting because they are, they are in a way the key stories about what it means to take risks and move forward mm -hmm. right yeah they went against their families even the because they their their beliefs or their love for these women or whatever was stronger than <clears throat> getting well, pushed they, into they, the yeah, wrong they, person Laurie, I think it's important for everyone to to obviously recognize that that they go they go against or they take risk, but they're still within the parameter of the clothing of the of the of the community, right. the family. You know, they're they're you know the only person who really is the um, uh, mo most risk taker and challenger is Gitty's husband Lippa. Lippy, who like actually, it. who actually, you know, he, he goes abroad, right? He, yeah. he, leave, he leaves and he, and he, he cuts his payout. He shaves his beard. Um, he, he, it's implied that he has an affair there. And yet he then comes back to the community and really wants again to be not only reunited with his wife and family and um, and grow, grows back his beard and, and peyote, and he is, he's becoming another part, you know, he comes back to the community. Um, June, did you want to say something? Sorry, I don't want to talk this whole time. I must keep no, Listen, if you do, it's okay. You know, I think with loss, 
um, I think there's forgiveness in this movie. There's a lot of loss and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's also a part of the, the spirituality in, in, in a group where you can have situations that are out of the ordinary, but you can bring people, can, people can come back and start again. So I think Lippa, Lippi, whatever her name was, uh, really reveals in some ways forgiveness and is that real forgiveness? Yeah, and in fact, it's it's highlighted at the very end of, towards the end of season three, where he has this moment of realization where he says to his wife, wait, wait a second, maybe it's not that you need to um, forgive me, I mean, that I need to forgive you, you need to forgive me, and let's, and, and you need to see your own piece in this. Wow. All right, so um, but going back to what Ivor suggested, um, here is a statement by the creator of Stissel, Ori, Ori Elon. Longing has always been at the heart of Stissel's story. Right from the first episode, the longing for the dead and no less the longing for the living. The unbridgeable distance that always exists between any two people, between family members, between loved ones, and also the unbridgeable distance within man himself, between the mind and the heart. So I really want to underscore what Ivor said, which is the, the one of the key themes here is the, the the family connection, and then also, as Laurie pointed out, the love connection um, that is redemptive for loss. All right. Um, so I want to. I, I have it written down here, but I just want to just relate to you. When I first watched the series of Schnitzel, it reminded me of a, bib a biblical narrative. What story in the Torah, in the Bible, does this, does this story resemble? What does it take its, its, its characters and lead from? So there's an elderly father who is a widow, whose wife has died, who is seeking a match for his son, and in fact, winds up doing what? This is the story of Abraham and Isaac. What does, what does Abraham in the end seek for Isaac as, as a wife? Isaac's cousin, Rebecca. So I want you to see how that motif kind of played out in Stissel, right? We've got Shulam, the older, the old father, uh, who is bereaved of his of his wife Devorah, and now his youngest child, the, his youngest son, he needs to still get him married, married, and um, uh, and even though he. Uh, Akiva goes through all of these different matches. He winds up, you know, in season two to find a woman who is the love of his life, and she is his first cousin. So, a nice little parallel between the story in the, in the Bible and this story that's being played out in Stissel. Okay, Melanie, someone's asking in the chat about where they can access the recording. So we will certainly let you know that, Lenore, and everyone else. All right, um, any, any, now, now that you see those parallels, any thoughts about that? Because there's also a comment in Genesis where it says when, when, when Rebecca is brought back to where Abraham and Isaac are by his servant Eliezer, Rebecca is brought in to 
um, meet Isaac. And it says that Isaac takes her for a wife and she is the comfort to him. In a way, the, the, the remedy for his grief over his mother's death. That's actually the language in the Torah. So I want you to see again that that makes good sense about Akiva and his, his resolution of his own grief for his mother. Um, did you notice, by the way, that um, there's a dream sequence in season one, I believe, might be in season two, where Akiva walks into his father's apartment uh, in the dream and he comes into the kitchen and his mother is, is cutting carrots and onions and cooking. And do you notice that she puts her hand on his cheek as she's talking to him? That same, that same exact motion occurs in, season, in the very first episode of season three, when um, uh, Libby touches the face of Akiva in the car, although she's dead already, this is, another, this is another fantasy that she's touching his cheek. So again, we see where he, the, the love that he finds in this new relationship in a way is a, um, is part of the process of his healing of the grief of his mother. And we certainly get the sense that he was very close to his mom. His mother, Devorah, was a, li a, a little bit of a, um, of a buffer to the harshness, the, the, the at times harshness of Shulam. Um, we, we see Shulam capable of being quite harsh, we can imagine that if Shulam thought it was okay to strike a student in the face, he would also strike his own son. But we don't have to, we don't have to imagine that because in season one, Shulam actually slaps his son, Kivi, as an adult right across the face. So that, that warmth and that uh, gentleness of mom is something that he dearly misses. All right. Um, could, could I comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I got the impression that the reason why the father slapped the son was because of what happened in the classroom. Because, are, is that the scene you're referring to? No, no. Oh, okay. uh, he, 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 sla he slaps Akiva in the face on the on the porch on right. their on the porch that that the, the the slapping of the of the boy in the classroom happens in season 3 that one occurred in season 1 okay well before okay and by the way i'm also happy if you request i'm happy to share my notes with anyone be interested. But here comes the sole theme of Stissel. This is the song that is that is the theme song of Stissel that starts every episode. Um, many of you probably skipped the introduction, so maybe you haven't even <laughs> paid attention to the song or the words, but here are the words. Where is everyone suddenly going? Pulling away and disappearing. Only the words are all floating. Where will we go from here? Another day goes by and bites, leaving an imprint on us. We manage to find a way, leaving our footprints on time. Where is everyone suddenly going? Pulling away and disappearing. Hmm. So this is, this is, it's of course sung in Hebrew by a well-known Israeli musician, Avi Baleli. All right. So that is in fact, the theme of Shtisel. 
And um, came across this uh, little quote from two French psychoanalysts. Um, Laurie, can you see it on the screen? Do you want to read that for us? Sure. Um, um, a man seated alone at a restaurant table who ordered, who ordered two different meals at the same time. He ate both of them as if he were sitting with another person. He seemed to be telling him. He seemed to telling himself. It's, yeah, it should, it should be. To, he seemed to, to be telling himself, "No, my loved one is not dead. She or he is still here." Oh, that's the words are moving around. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like before, with the same taste, choosing the same favorite foods. Okay. So, loss is not so such an easy thing to get over, right? And we, um, uh, we are challenged by the, the issues of, get, of, of the grief that we experience through the loss. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples of what these French psychoanalysts were talking about. It shows up um, at the, at the, in the very first opening scene of Schitzel. And then we see it repeated over and over again throughout all of the seasons um, and highlighted especially in Akiva's relationship with the, the first woman that he really loves. And that is Elisheva, who herself is a widow twice over. Um, and uh, we'll see that scene as well. So I'm hoping that everything will work well in terms of my sharing my screen and Netflix. Um, I'm gonna open the Netflix thing first. So let's see how this goes. So after the, after the song that starts, um, as the theme song of Stisco, th this is the very first scene that we see in, in Stisco. Okay. All right, that's the very opening of Stessel. So what are we what are we being introduced and what are we seeing here in this opening scene? An image of his mother. Go ahead, June. What what were you saying? No, I was saying it's probably a fantasy that it's his mother. Well, he's having a dream about encountering his his mom. She's now yeah. she died, and he ha is having this dream yeah. about being reunited with her. Right, which is um, 
the, the, the part of loss, how you, the body copes with loss is through dreams also. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting beginning because it alerts you to the theme of loss very early on. Right. We don't even know the characters yet, right? We don't know. We don't know what's happened. Um, by the way, there's a there's a parallel to the beginning of season three because we also don't know. This was the big surprise of season three. We don't know that there was loss, right? Yeah. And we and we and we and we imagine that that life has continued. What about the theme of uh, existential loneliness? Isn't this also very much about? that loneliness that man lives with every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet, going back to the point that was made before about how this is a show about a family, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the, the loneliness is something that we experience with others too, right? In other words, there, there's a shared grief here Mm -hmm. um, amongst all of the family, mm -hmm. but we but we see it most in reference to Shulam, the father, and Akiva. Mm -hmm. It's quite remarkable, actually, that we don't. I mean, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to spin through the, the the different episodes. I don't recall much of anything about the other children, Sviarya and Gitti. Mm -hmm. um, really focusing on their mother's death mm -hmm. but but for um and even for the the uh, the daughter that lives up north who has left the left the family there's really uh there's really not much that is representative of that loss but but definitely shared between shulam and between akiva any other comments about the no the notion of starting the show just this way. Yes, Leslie. Uh, Leslie, unmute yourself. Yeah. So um, I was struck by the humor in the fact that I, I'm assuming he's telling this to Shalom. Is that what it was? I can't remember back that far. Um, he well, he has, no, he has the dream first. Right. And then he, then he is sitting with his dad in the morning and telling him the dream. Right. So this, I think, is when he's telling his father the dream. And his father's comment wasn't anything about you saw your mother in the dream or, or you know, you know, you know, how was she, you know, and all that stuff. It was like, uh, how do you know what an Eskimo looks like? I think that was it really sets the stage for the humor in this uh, show. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. So someone put in the chat, why is she eating Kugel or why does she want? Kugel? Well, you know, again, um, this is a this is a mother who not only eats kugel she makes makes kugel she is the matriarch of the family and she takes care of everyone through the food that she prepares and 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 provides um but uh, just a quick question why 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 insert an eskimo into the dream yeah ivor well i think that he sees his mother his mother says she's cold and she can't change it she, she I, I think that's i sees her as lying in her grave cold uh, this is death and uh you know the the eskimos is as far from israel as uh, as anything could possibly be and uh and so the ice and the cold and the inaccessibility of that area to him uh, is as inaccessible as his mother, who is deceased. So, I think yeah, I, 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 I didn't think of, I didn't think of that word either, but I like it. Inex inaccessible. Um, not only are pickles not not uh, available, but um, uh, his his the warmth of his mother is unavailable, and he's le he's left out in the cold. Mm -hmm. Right, that's where that's where he is, and that's where his struggle is. Um, and Leslie, it's an important point because Shulam, you know, there are there are rare moments where Shulam actually, I, I would say, has sensitivity. Um, but in general, he is not a very emotionally sensitive person. Um, 
And that is part of the struggle that the whole family has with dealing with emotions, but in particular, uh, Akiva and his ability to separate from his father. All right. Um, but I also thought it was, it was, it was uh, the idea again of someone sitting down and eating a meal with the deceased, right? He's not eating, he's not eating two meals but he's eating a meal with the deceased. And this is a theme that gets picked up on in the, in the next segment as well. And this is from season one, episode five. All right, so. And we'll just quickly get there. And if you recall, his love interest, the, the woman that he actually would like to marry, um, is Elisheva. So Elisheva, we, we don't even know whether this is real or fantasy, but Elisheva is heading up north to her old apartment, which she has kept. And she's bringing food, a pot of, a pot of uh, food for, we're not even sure who she's bringing it for. <laughs> See, uh, God, God is there in the context. So what do we see in this one, in this, in this scene? Yes. She, she also sees her, her um, deceased husband's um, kind of the same way Stitzel saw his deceased mom. And uh, she kept the old apartment that she used to have with these men and brings them some soup, has conversations with them. Mm -hmm. Now this is a little different, right? Because this is not a dream. This is right. a fantasy, mm -hmm. right? And we're caught in this. You no, know, when we're when we're when we realize it's a dream, we say, "Oh well, you know, we have dreams too." There's that's a dream, but yeah. this is a little more unusual because here's a woman who's fantasizing that she is still in relationship with these deceased husbands, but she plays it out to the degree of actually traveling and bringing them food. Um, but then that affords her to have a conversation with them, right. which is it's really- sort of shocking to watch. Yeah, which is really a conversation with herself. Right. Okay, <laughs> what else? Yeah, Andrew. I'm gonna say that um, the one who appeared to be uh, more religious, I, I think was her first husband, and he's criticizing her for um, being too attractive. 
which is not her fault. She's a beautiful woman, you know, and the second husband is defending her. And um, that's why it's always good to have two first husbands. <laughs> if, one, if one doesn't, if one's critical, maybe the other one will defend you. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. I don't know your name. I just see numbers, but go ahead. Okay. And I, I, I don't watch just Schistel, but I've heard about it and I've read about it and I don't think they had a conversation. They had an argument in that s snippet that you showed us. It really wasn't a conversation. They were really like antagonistic to each other. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and in a way, uh, what is your name by the way? Leona. Leona. Um, no, yeah, now thank you. Leona, um, in the end, just like we are the creators of our own dreams, right? So, so therefore, everything that happens in a dream is in a way reflective of our own inner dialogue. In this fantasy, it's also reflective of her, of her own inner dialogue. She probably felt bad about what happened on the bus and then wondered maybe she should have done something different. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not laying any blame on her. I'm just talking about what what's being what's being shown in her, uh, you know, uh, subconscious here about what what it is that she is feeling guilty about. But you notice also that here comes the theme, which is that she's also telling us why she is stuck why she can't move on. And what is she stuck about? Why is it in the end that she will be unable in a way to, to go along with and marry Akiva? What is keeping her stuck? She doesn't wanna, she doesn't want to experience loss again. She says that she alludes to that in one of the episodes. And then it seemed like in this scene, she was almost trying to get approval from the approval in her fantasy that, because the one husband says, well, there's room for one more. <laughs> <laughs> but but Lori, 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 that actually is the point, which is, this is the dead man's table. So there's room for another dead man. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm saying that, that 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 is exactly what you just said, which is <clears throat> it's expressing her fear that if she marries yet another man, okay. now, she, now she can go visit and, and just bring a bigger pot of soup. <laughs> yeah. huh. well, I think or, also... Uh, she, or is it that she, Sorry. Go ahead, Ivor. No, or is it that she can't leave the other two? She's locked into that past. Yeah, so... Those are the, those I think are the are two of maybe some other possibilities too. But I would say yes, you're right. Um, she hasn't quite she hasn't quite let go of them. But to Lori's point, there's a part of her that says, "We're giving you permission. Go go ahead. That's, that's not a problem here." But remember, that's her inner dialogue. So she she has that inner dialogue of, "I do have permission to move on." And by the way, we see this in season three where Akiva has to go to the cemetery and ask of Libby permission to move on, right? So Elisheva was granted that permission in her inner dialogue, but Lori was correct in pointing out that, that she actually does, she makes the subconscious conscious by saying, uh, I'm, I'm concerned of what will happen to the next, per, next, next man. But, she then finally overcomes that and is willing to marry him. Yeah, Andrea. Well, then she backed out. But I think she, um, she actually, actually met Akiba through her son at the zoo. Right. And I think she, um, and he's very immature. He's very childlike. And I think she's got her hands full raising one child and maybe doesn't want to take on another child because he is very childlike. Yeah, but there is this spark that's there between them. And um, uh, 
that's where love, ro romance and love can sometimes be that, that ingredient that allows someone to overcome the, the loss that they're experiencing. And um, in a way you could say that they're, they're both grieving and therefore that's actually what brings them together, right? Her unresolved grief and his unresolved grief is bringing them together as a way to, um, but because he is, he is as immature as he is, um, you know, uh, we don't have to be um, psychoanalytic about this, but he is, he is getting connected to an older woman who would be, I mean, Andrea, we could turn your point around, which is she looks like a good mother to her son maybe she'd be a good mother for me too, All right? <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Um, so what, what else can we see from this, from this theme that's developing of loss and grief and being stuck and, and the, the process of resolution of that and to move forward and to move on? What else are we seeing? So what, someone suggested also um, that the paintings are a window, his paintings are a window into his process of healing. Mm -hmm. are, you, are, you, are you remembering what his final painting was about during the first two seasons? Was that the painting of his mother and father? Is that what you're referring um, to? It's a painting, Suzanne, just of his mother. Oh. But, well, it's actually, as he says, as he explains on the television interview, it's not a painting of his mother, but it is a painting of his mother. Um, and what is the mother, what is the mother doing? The mother is holding a baby. Mm -hmm. Right. So he is building up through the paintings that he's doing to come to that place where he can resolve the loss of his mother. He's also the youngest child in his family, isn't he? He's the baby. He's is the baby, and babies typically are kept babies, kept as a baby longer than the older children. Yeah, Suzanne, we, we see in fact that, that, that through his dreams and other recollections, that his mother actually coddled him, yeah. um, which he enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Right? The other, the other children are already married and out of the house, Akiva, Akiva is the is the is the one younger child who has yet to really separate and move forward. Okay. Yes, June. Uh, and unmute yourself. Um, it's interesting to me that it's representing the man who's so sensitive and all that. Is there a message in that that it was not a woman about a woman? You know, it really, uh, what have we been talking about? The father's kind of rough. You know, you're not sort of showing much sensitivity in the men, but. Yeah, the only, well, the, June actually is interesting because who, who in fact is the most sensitive man in the, in the seat, in all, in all the show? Who, who is, who is the more emotional, sensitive man? Lippe. Lippe. Who? Lippe. Isn't it Lippe? Lippa, yeah. Lippa is actually, I think, a, a, repre a representative of that. Gitti, his wife, is a little more like the father, like Shulam. Uh, but she marries a man who maybe is a little more like her mother. Um, and he, he's the one who has always the sensitivity and the recognition of his son Yasala to really, you know, 
be in touch with him and in touch with his with his aspirations and his emotions. Well, I so, love it. Yeah, go ahead. We don't see it. We don't think of it as men um, having all this emotional side. And this is very nice to learn that there's men that are really sensitive because I don't think that's what we generally accept or think about in the Haredi. Yeah. And, and again, um, again, we go, we go to the universal theme, right? Which is whether it's Haredi or any other, any other, you know, culture or ethnicity, um, you know, men in general are seen that way. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have that juxtaposition of men like Lippa and his son Yasala who have that sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Although Nuchum, Nuchum, Shulam's brother and Shulam, um, you know, they, they certainly don't, do not represent that sensitive side. Now, Akiva does too, Akiva as well, you know, with his, with his artistic sensitivity his sweetness and love for his wife, and then his acceptance of and love for Racheli, even though she has some uh, mental health issues. But his, but his immediate sensitivity towards her, which is quite beautiful. All right, we're, we're, on, we're almost out at the one o'clock time. What I wanna just uh, uh, preface for you is that I, I would like to look at the different uh, art pieces that he creates. Um, there are 10 of them. And whenever we see that number 10, we like to link it with the tree of life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that may be a new concept to some of you, but the tree of life is the map of Kabbalah, which has different energies. Um, so we're gonna look at that uh, without getting too, uh, you, you won't you won't need to understand the tree of life to understand what we're going to talk about. But but that is the basis of it, which is these different energies that are represented by his progression. Now he winds up producing how many more paintings that we know of? Nineteen more, um, because Kaufman, who is the art uh, dealer. The, the one who owns the studio says that he painted 18 uh, pictures of his wife. And I thought there was significant that they picked, that he picked, he drew 18. Of course, 18 is the, num the number uh, in, uh, in Jewish life that represents the word life, chai. So he painted her life, right? He painted the, her life and is keeping her alive in a way through the paintings. Um, but he does paint the 19th one, and that is of Racheli. Um, so she is the, the final painting that we see him, him uh, create. But we're gonna look at the 10 um, paintings that he did uh, through the first two seasons. And there are, there are many, many, many themes uh, to look at uh, as well. Uh, Suzanne? There's also 18 blessings in the uh, Amida. Well, there was, an, there was an original 18 and then they added one. So that made 19. Right. <laughs> All right. So, um, and by the way, there's, there, there's, there's interesting things to point out about people's names here too, um, including the fact that his, the love of his life is Libi in Hebrew, which means ha my heart. All right, but we'll also get a chance to see uh, a little more about the use of names and how they play out. All right, um, I hope this was of interest. We're not going to focus on as much on season three because um, I'm going to be teaching a class on season three over the summer. Um, but I wanted to at least you know ha have you ha have you. The, have the opportunity to understand what kind of teachings we do around a film of Shtisel and connecting it with uh, Kabbalah and our Jewish spiritual uh, 
study. Uh, nice to meet all of you, um, and I will see you hopefully all next week. And to those who I know, nice to see you. Mm -hmm.